Welcome to Grail Country. My guest today is Laura, who has been on the channel a few times before. She's a fairly regular conversation partner. I find her to be a very good conversation partner, which is why I keep inviting her back. Um, today, we have uh, got together to discuss the topic of courtly love. And in particular, we're going to be talking about it through the lens of a lot of the German material. Um, uh, Laura is uh, an expert in the German language and very familiar with the material. And so she's going to enlighten me with some of her expertise on that subject matter. But I just had a, as a funny thing, a funny exercise to start with. I actually, so um, as some people who follow the channel closely may know, I'm a big fan of a fairly obscure role-playing game from the eighties. Um, from It was published, first published in 1985 called King Arthur Pendragon. And one of the features of this game is like is courtly love is actually a feature of the game. And I wanted to re and I know the first edition actually says a lot less than later editions of the game. Later editions of the game actually go into a bit more of the historical stuff. But the the original game just kind of describes how it works mechanically. And then it just has this one little sentence. And I wanted to see what you thought of it. So this is from the first edition of the King Arthur Pendragon role-playing game. Under the heading Duties, a knight of romance adores all women and must do everything in his nature and ability to protect women, to deliver them justice, to respect them, and to do their bidding. He must honor every lady as if she were his own lover. Nice. From the King Arthur Pendragon role-playing game in 1985. That sounds legit to me. <laughs> That's, yeah, like, that's, that's why I shared it, because it's actually like pretty much, it's yeah, a really succinct way of like capturing what I think is this, the full spirit of it, and why I think, despite some of the areas that make it kind of, that, that make might make you kind of squeamish, the way it ends up being very Christian yeah. in the final analysis, and that sentence like really captures it. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so, okay, now that you've said I'm an expert, maybe I need to say a little bit about my qualifications. Go for it. So I studied German at the University of St. Andrews, and I did a postgrad degree in MLIT in medieval literature with Jeffrey Ashcroft and uh, William Jackson. And uh, so I have a lot of these little orange books. Hmm. Anyone who's done German studies knows orange means medieval. Oh, is that really? Is there a color coding? For... Yeah. <laughs> okay. From the Reformation onwards, everything is yellow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But the medieval stuff is orange. It's those little reclam books. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. So the medieval period this... has yeah. been a particular emphasis of your in your in your in your German studies. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did several courses in, as an undergrad, and then I studied it further as a postgrad. So you now, really do have an expertise. I wasn't making it up. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> and I wrote a thesis on Wagner's use of medieval source material for my yes. own life. Yes. yes. Let's go ahead. You want to just go ahead and lay into Wagner like right off the bat? And that I thing you share with me today, it's like, wow. I kind of uh -huh. like His, what he thought of Wolfram? Yeah, I oh, have no oh. idea. Uh -huh. Actually, it's funny because it's like, I don't think, I think he just didn't understand him. I agree. Well, I'll lay into Wagner if it becomes relevant. I think if Wagner had actually that, understood but... Wolfram better, he would realize that they were much closer than Wagner himself believed them to be believed them to be believed himself to be like it it really surprises me yeah well so part of wagner's difficulty is that 19th century medieval studies didn't have that much information or not that much scholarship had been done right so um right. in some ways he didn't have that much to draw on for understanding medieval literature so we'll give him an excuse there but anyway um yes so the reason we're doing this talk is I did a talk with PBK and Sam about, um, for lack of a better word, early church sex negativity or how much asceticism was prized as another way, another way we could say it, right? And how the old attitude that goes on for many, many centuries in Christendom seems to be that the sexual act should uh, play as small a role in your life as possible because there's really nothing salutary in it, right? It's It has a lot of potential to lead you astray, but it doesn't seem to have much potential to be redeemed. So do it when it's necessary because you want to have children. But apart from that, 
try to avoid it because it's not really that good for your soul, right? Um, so for, as a reminder of that, I have a couple quotes that I didn't read in my talk with Sam and PVK, but I think they'll give you the flavor of this older view. So here's St. Augustine talking about lust. Um, he says, lust not only takes possession of the whole body, but also makes itself felt within and moves the whole man with a passion in which mental emotion is mingled with bodily appetite. So that the pleasure which results is the greatest of all bod bodily pleasures. So possessing indeed is this pleasure that at the moment of time in which it is consummated, all mental activity is suspended. What friend of wisdom and holy joys, who being married, but knowing, as the apostle says, how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the disease of desire as the Gentiles who know not God, would not prefer, if this were possible, to beget children without this lust, so that in this function of begetting offspring, the members created for this purpose should not be stimulated by the heat of lust, but should be actuated by his volition in the same way as his other members serve him for their respective ends. That's a really long sentence. But basically, the way I would summarize that point is, Augustine is thinking it would be really great if you could use your reproductive organs to make babies in the same way that like you use your feet to walk to the store, right? Like, it would be nice if they were under that level of rational control. <laughs> And the, and you didn't get swept away by using them, right? Okay. And then another quote that I have here is you kind of relevant. Out, you, know, you know what stood out to me the most in that sentence from Augustine is like his like his level of discomfort in mm. the fact that his he is out of touch with his uh, the part about all mental activities, yeah, ceases, yeah. Right? The yeah. fact that he becomes like he becomes out of touch with his, uh, with yeah. his, uh, with his reasoning faculty, like that's mm -hmm. like the fact that he sees that as a negative mm -hmm. is, I think, important in terms of mm -hmm. understanding like why this attitude undergoes a change. I think. Yes, there's an assumption that that's a really bad problem. Whereas actually, that's what most people really love about sexual love, right? Is this this idea of like getting swept up in something that's bigger than you, right? Um, right. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm I wondering. Also, yeah. So it's like you, you know, it's like given that like you know, August, Augustine is like very Platonist in his framing. I, I'm wondering. It's like I'm wondering about like. I'm wondering I'm wondering what he really thought about like participation in Eros and like why for him like it seems like there's like it seems like for Augustine the loss of the rational fac faculty means loss of the ability to control what the what that is aiming toward. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That okay. So that's yeah. That makes sense. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, okay, then okay, I'll just okay, read okay. my second one. I'm just so trying to get myself that. into Augustine's yeah, perspective yeah. as much as I can. But leaving Augustine behind, I have one from much later. Okay. This is Guibert of Nogent, who was an abbot in France in the early 1100s, and he wrote a very interesting autobiography. I the copy that I have is called A Monk's Confession. I think. So this would be like this would be roughly contemporaneous to when the material we're going to talk about starts yes. popping up. So yeah, that's so that makes it a good example. Yeah. yeah. And he writes a lot about his family and he really admires his mother. And it, in the course of telling you what a good and pious woman his mother was, he says, my mother cherished her widowhood as if she had always borne the duties of the marriage bed with horror. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think a, I think that's something even a lot of modern men can identify with. Like, <laughs> it's like in terms of when it comes to thinking about their mothers. Oh, like, sure. You right? know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like that remains like that. That's like that's something that I think we can still identify with even today. It's like, yeah, and that's funny. <laughs> but you know, he could have chosen not to say anything about his mother's he attitude have, towards he sex. He but have. he thinks it's important to tell you that she really hated sex yeah, yeah, because yeah. she was a really pious person. 
Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> My mother had sex only one time. And just, just... <laughs> okay. Or as many, however well, many siblings he had. So that is a long established attitude, like amongst the clerical class. Right. And then in the high middle ages, we get this courtly love poetry, which is very different from that. And maybe the first thing I should say about it is that there is in some quarters a misconception about courtly love poetry, that it is as chaste as the monks would have liked it to be, but it is not, right? Did you grow up with that idea of medieval courtly love that it was all about not consummating your desires? Yeah, that is what I was, that, that is, yeah. And I actually like, I mean, I was educated long enough ago that like, it was at a time when the, like, the influence of um, uh, Cathar belief and mm. Sufism was still taken quite seriously. Um, so I don't know if that's something you want to address or not, but that is like that, like that's an earlier that's... academic theory is that like yeah. somehow this developed under the influence of, uh, of Sufi mysticism yeah. or was influenced by the Cathar sect. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to keep it relatively course, narrow, so I wasn't planning a geographical on talking about Cathar. I can the Cathar thing. I kind of get a little bit because at least there's a there's a coincidence of geography mm -hmm. with the French like, stuff. You mean? Yeah, with the yeah, French yeah. material, it's like the troubadours are really coming out of Languedoc, and that's where the the center of the Albigensian heresy are. Yeah, well, I'd well. be more likely to see their poetry as a reaction against Cathars, if anything, like if it has anything. Right, to because the cat, they have that, yeah, right. Because it's all about how sweet consummating your love is. Thank but in both cases, but in both cases, it is seen as a as a poetry of mysticism, where the where the the mortal beloved is standing in for the place of of act of the divine. Mm. So, yeah, um, but you don't think so? Yeah. Well, um, so. no, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it has anything to do with cathars, no. Um, I could say a little more about that, but I want to try and keep it sort of narrow because if we go all over the place, oh, yeah, gonna, yeah, 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 it's gonna I'm, be like last time, and we're just gonna be like, yes. um, yes, and you, we'll be I, 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 yeah, you got to keep me in check because I will <laughs> derail any conversation because. I just, whatever occurs to my intuition in the moment, I'll just go with it. Uh, so, okay. Please keep me on track. So, uh, medieval courtly love poetry is not particularly chaste. Um, there is, there are dawn songs, right? Songs where lovers who are not supposed to be together have to say goodbye to each other at dawn. Um, there are various songs about people sleeping together. There are... Um, courtly romances about adultery like Gottfried's Tristan um, and Gottfried portrays the adultery in Tristan very very positively and tells you that the lovers are a good example to you and you're going to learn how to be a good lover from hearing their story but it is a story that's all about um, you know people cheating on the woman's husband okay um, <laughs> and there is, however, an element of um, believing that true love has value even if you don't get to consummate it, mm -hmm. right? And th it's important that that is there. So it's not purely sensual, right? Right. There's and, also and, this and, spiritual and element. And in some of the yeah. material, and some of the material, and I don't, I don't like, again, I don't really think I... I've read a lot of the German material other than Wolfram. So you would know the German material better. But in what I it, like in a lot of what I've read, there is that sense. And then also there's also a sense that like often like it's the adultery was was what spoiled it. There's a sense there's a sense that you get like if the love had remained chaste, it would have been better. And somehow it's the it's the and, and and may have led to something beyond it but the fact that it's the fact that it's consummated is usually what throws the court into chaos and brings mm -hmm. destruction in its wake well the problem with Gottfried's Tristan is that he didn't get to finish it so we don't know quite how he where, where it all would have ended up gotcha gotcha that's unfortunate um also I should point out that there are positive portrayals of orderly married relationships in these poems it's not like it's all adultery 
Right. So Eric and Anita is a very good example. Do you know that one? No, I don't. Okay, well, that's a great story. I would very much advise anyone to read that. I actually just recently read Chrétien de Troyes' version. So Chrétien de Troyes wrote one, and then um, Hartmann von Aue wrote the German version. Mm -hmm. And the story there is that Eric wins this beautiful bride, Anita, in a very honor, um, honorable way. And it's all very courtly and beautiful. And then they get married. And they love each other so much that he never gets out of bed before noon. And he just kind of neglects to do any further deeds of chivalry because he's so focused on living with his wife. And then people start trash talking him and he has to gain his reputation back. So he and Anita kind of go out adventuring and he puts her in dangerous situations where he gets to go and save her, stuff like that. Um, and at the end, they're still married and it's happy. And so that's a really nice story about like a legitimate marriage where the two married people really love each other and it works out great. So it's not like they're all sad stories about about adultery or or unrequited love, you know. So that's, um, interesting. That, yes. that, that's interesting because that would like be kind of like under undermine the what, what is generally like considered to be the paradigm yeah yeah so yeah and at this point maybe it would be good to read out some of the characteristics that are considered to be the defining characteristics of courtly love so number one this is this is from 19th century scholarship but these kind of got solidified in the popular imagination is yeah this is what courtly love is number one is courtly love is illegitimate and therefore necessarily secretive um but as we see not always there are many stories of illegitimate courtly love and lots of little poems about that are clearly about illegitimate relationships but but that's not always the case number two is courtly love manifests itself in the submissiveness of the man who considers himself the servant of his lady and seeks to fulfill her desires that is definitely a recurring theme and in real life at court, people were doing things like men would drink the water that a lady had washed her hands in. You know, like if a woman washes her hands in a bowl of water, he'll, he'll come along and drink that bowl of water. Um, so <laughs> kind of interesting. Like there are all these little gestures going on in the real world of people trying to think, how can we, we make these love relationships really noble and beautiful and inspiring. And then it's also in these stories too. And a lot of courtly love poetry is, you know, men begging women for their favor. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the woman whether she chooses to bestow it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, courtly love demands that a man strive to become better and more perfect in order to be more worthy of his lady. That's very common. Number four, courtly love is an art, a science, and a virtue with its own rules and laws that the lovers must master um yes and in connection with that it's worth pointing out that when Gottfried talks about Tristan and Isolde and their adulterous affair he describes them he describes them always in very positive terms and he at one point he says their relationship was of such pure fidelity and what he means is they were faithful to each other and that was the right. important thing right because they had true love and if you have true love with another person Faithful to love, I think. Yeah, not just yeah. faithful to each other, but faithful to love, right? Yeah, faithful, to, faithful love. to each other and faithful to this concept of a certain kind of love, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that makes them morally good, whatever else they may have done, right? In his eyes. So, um, reading those, we talked a little bit last time about last time in the video that we haven't published because it was too messy about ways <laughs> in which courtly love is still with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to thinking about ways that courtly love was still with us in just in the standards of the dating world when we were young, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, well, do you have anything to say about like, do you think that it seems like and this may be because it's do you think that there's some kind of connection between like the courtly love in the medieval tradition and the later romantic movement? Because there seems to be oh, yeah. like 
a kindred. Okay, well, so the article you shared with me that, that I just read by Michael, it was Michael Novak, right? Michael Novak, yeah. The thing that he describes, I would say that's more 19th century romanticism. Right. But 19th century romanticism was, romanticism was very enamored of medieval literature. So, but they had their own spin on it. He's drawing yeah. on do you a, wanna Do you want to summarize right, he's draw, yeah, what he's he drawing said in that on article? a view of courtly love that's developed by a particular scholar um like a belgian scholar whose name i can't remember off the top of my head because um was it de Rougemont? yeah that's who it was yeah so that's basically where he's getting his like so so this i he's going based on his on de Rougemont's, uh character characterization of courtly love which i i agree with you it sounds more like romanticism to me mm -hmm. um so that gives us an opportunity to talk about like what the distinction might be if you have hmm. anything to say on that. Maybe first I should just keep covering the points that I wanted to make sure to cover. You got it. We can <laughs> we can circle back around to that. Yeah, because I'm still thinking of my Well, that might lead with, us into talking yeah. about Wagner. Actually. Yeah, pro yeah, it would, yeah. So, but, so to stay in the Middle Ages for a moment, I'm still thinking of my conversation with PVK and Sam because that's the reason we're having this conversation. Yes. So when I look back on what Christian morality was like in those earlier days, and then I look at this courtly love movement. In some respects, it seems to me that this is the sophisticated people among the laity pushing back at the church a bit and saying, look, men and women really love each other. And also look how beautiful we can make this. Like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. There's so much to it. You know, there's like so much joy. It's so multi-layered. It's such right. a big part of life. Like, let's celebrate it. And Lewis argues that yeah. this is like a far more enduring impact on our culture than the Reformation. C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. He argues well, that courtly, lo thing. courtly love essentially creates the cult, the civilization of the West, as far as he's concerned. So my conclusion, and, that, about and then in comparison, oh. the Reformation is a blip on the radar. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really had time to think about that, but um. I'm going to say, oh, yeah, okay. So the thing I was going to say is that courtly love is not in itself the solution to the problem of how should Christians view sex because it has enough illegitimate elements or selfish elements to it, or or maybe not selfish, but um, elements that are just removed from Christian morality. Like it's at, it's at odds with Christian morality often enough that you can't say it's the solution, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but it, it's a voice that we needed to hear, I think. And I think Lewis actually is a person who managed to take the best lessons of courtly love culture and synthesize them really well with Christian morality. And it comes through in the Space Trilogy, which everyone's been reading lately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you read it? Yeah. I've read yeah. it multiple times. I just did yeah. a conversation about uh, that hideous strength on uh, Karen's channel oh, with okay. uh, Kyle and Karen and uh, who else was it? There was one other person. I'm drawing, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. I apologize for forgetting. <laughs> but you know, there's oh, a Luke, lot of Luke, that... Luke. How can I forget Luke? It was Luke. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's a lot in that hideous strength about what a good married relationship is. And what it is on the spiritual plane, as well as what it is as you're living it out in the physical world. And there's that final chapter of Venus at St. Anne's. Yeah, he's dealing with it. Yeah. He's dealing with that in that throughout that throughout the entire trilogy. He's dealing with this idea of like archetypal masculinity and archetypal femininity, yeah. too, that you can also see like is definitely something that's being developed in courtly love because it's like it's this common like it's this softening of the of the more martial aspects of chivalry mm -hmm. and bringing a feminine side to it yes and it's very playful as well there's a lot of humor do you think people realize that there's a lot of humor in courtly love poetry no i don't think they do there's like a lot of coy kind of tee -hee sort of right. humor yeah <laughs> so... <laughs> Give us an example. Uh, so, Give us an yeah, example. Well, so a good example is Walter von der Vogelweide has a poem where he describes how he spied on a woman stepping out of her bath. And he describes how beautiful she is. And he'll say, you know, oh, her hair and her face and her beautiful neck. 
and oh her feet were really lovely and her legs were shapely whatever and then and then he'll be like "Ooh, but i can't tell you what was in between them <laughs> um <laughs> And there are like puns about breaking flowers, right? right um, right. which yeah. could mean picking flowers, or it could mean you're lying down in a meadow and the flowers are going to break because you're lying right, on right, them. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, yeah. Or there's this is also Walter. There's a poem where a man tries to explain to a woman who has never had a love affair what a love affair entails, and he says, "Well, you should take a man's body and give him yours in exchange." And she says, well, I can't think of anyone whose body I would want to take. That sounds like it would hurt him. I wouldn't want to hurt that person. And so it's all kind of like snicker, snicker. You know? <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Good yeah. examples. And the French poets did this as well, right? Like I have right. more expertise than the German guys, but Michael Martin right. singles out the troubadours. So I feel like we should talk about the troubadours yeah. themselves. Well, like that's that. generally like, I mean, that's like most people, that's where they go. Like the French yeah. usually... Well, because the French originated the trend and then and then yeah. Germany borrowed it and carried right. it on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they're very similar. Yes. Um, and yeah, and the troubadours had a lot of a lot of the same kind of thing or like they would do like little debates that were in the style of theological debates. But they would be over questions like and this is this is in France, I'm saying now, like uh, questions like, all right, so and so's lady told him that if he did a service for her, she would lie in bed with him all night naked but she wouldn't let him do anything else and um so who got more out of that encounter or like who did more for whom and then there'd be like a little back and forth debate about it um it's but it's kind of jokey you know <laughs> right 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 that's good. that's good yeah and i think lewis understands that as well because lewis always talks about how there should be humor in sexual relationships Mm-hmm. And he, he uses a, yeah, phrase, I think that uh, yeah, again, he likes the, the phrase well, laughter loving can, Aphrodite. Uh, you can see the humor, yeah, the humor in it, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so do you want to talk a little more about how it's still with us? Yeah, I would and love to how talk. it's not as much with us now as it was when I was young. No, she never is think, dead. Yeah, th I think, yeah, I want to see where that goes because that go ahead morning oh well you first well it's just like it's it's interesting because as like as it goes away what i see well i shared that milbank quote from you right with you right yes mm -hmm. right so this i is, don't remember what it was I shared it, <laughs> right well essentially pointing out that like you know as as christian culture fades and this courtly love, oh, that however was else it is, is definitely a product of Christian culture. Mm -hmm. And I would say that romanticism too, like as later on, is also something that is could really only come out of a Christian culture. Like there's something like there's something about the romantic movement that like makes it necessarily a product of a Christian culture. And not only that, necessarily the product of a Christian culture that had already earlier developed this idea of courtly love. Like it couldn't have happened otherwise um but so what i see happening now as like as the influence of christianity in our culture fades is there seems to be a reversion to to a pagan view which yes. really which makes like it it makes violence come back into the picture in a way mm -hmm. and violence and power dynamics come back into the picture in in a very like ugly way um that we're in deep denial about yeah it's shocking like i read these twitter threads from people saying basically they've just learned some new horrifying fact about what the sexual landscape is like for young people and it always blows me away with just how brutal it is right yeah yeah um and when i observe and brutal people, and brutal or isolated yeah one of, yeah. One of the, other. One of the yeah. two which is its yeah. own kind of brutality and when i see young men and women interacting i don't see that kind of courtliness that men used to feel like they had to have towards women mm -hmm. even in our generation and we're right. so far removed in time from right. the courtly love era but right. we had the standard in our minds right of how men are supposed to treat women yeah. um yeah 
even even I, yeah even even a full generation after like the sexual revolution like yeah that for i mean for 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 my generation that was still very much very much was part of it. i mean like it will be made fun of and challenged but it was still there yeah and uh this idea oh no where did it go that that element of courtly love about how a man is supposed to make himself better to be worthy of his lady mm -hmm. You know, I feel like a lot of boys had that attitude when I was like a teenager, you know? I think that was pretty common. So what what do you think? So what what has shifted? I might be the wrong person to ask. Okay, that's fine. I mean, you may not, yeah. Because <laughs> I ran away from society let's, to let's live like, with a bunch of staunch Let's Catholics leave that thread long. hanging for a moment, and then let's go <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah, get somebody let, else on. But no, 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 let's just leave <laughs> that thread hanging for a moment. And then we'll talk about, we'll just talk about this this development, this development of, like, courtly love and, and its lasting impact. Maybe we could circle around to the connection to romanticism. And then maybe as we're discussing that, maybe some something will present itself as to like what's what's changed yeah so shall we cover a poem an actual poem absolutely okay well it. so first i'm going to read the one that michael martin quotes in sophia in exile because okay. he's part of the reason why we're having this discussion yes yes so he quotes a troubadour poem from france good lady I ask you nothing at all except to make me your servant, for I'll serve you as I would a good lord, and never ask for another reward. So here I am at your command, a frank, humble heart, courtly and glad. You're surely not a lion or a bear who'd slay me when I surrender. So, yeah. Um... So this one appears very chaste, at least on the surface. Although yeah. sometimes there's a subtext of these poems that I'm gonna well, yeah. I'm gonna keep working but, on you, right? Uh, there, yeah, there's also there's this a, time there's I'm gonna a tell you I'm not hoping for I mean, anything, but maybe if I what, make you like me enough, eventually you'll give me something. <laughs> yeah, well, also yeah. slay might be a double on tongue too. Yes, yeah. Depending on the yeah. language, you know. Yeah. yeah. Certainly is in earlier in, in early modern English. It certainly would have been. Yes. So that can be a hard thing about interpreting medieval poetry, because these people had relationships with each other. They had in-jokes at court, right? They were making references to things we might not know about. And we don't know that much about them as individuals. And we don't right. know that much about their listeners as individuals either. Like we know about the courtly setting. But the people who wrote these poems, it's actually amazing how little we know about them considering how much we're used to knowing about, say, a famous novelist or poet, you know, in the modern era, like Gottfried von Strasbourg, who wrote Tristan, right. one of the great authors of the German Middle Ages. We know his name was Gottfried. <laughs> we know he was from Strasbourg. Uh, we know he had a beef with Wolfram. We suppose he was a cleric in minor orders because of the kind of education he shows in the poem. Mm. But we don't have, like, facts about his life. We figure that he died while writing writing Tristan, not only because Tristan is unfinished, but because I believe the continuators also say that he died. Do we know? Because for a while there was a theory. Do we know who his patron that, was? We probably do, but I don't remember. Okay, okay. I was say, usually that's one of the facts <laughs> that we do usually know. Yes, we do tend uh, to know who people's patrons were. Yeah. I was just the cleric of minor orders thing. I I I, I like the the uh, the email that you sent me uh, earlier when we were kind of having the back and forth setting up this conversation. I couldn't help but notice that like exorcist was on the list of like yeah. what was considered minor orders. I know. I always think it's surprising that exorcist is a minor exorcist, order. The other well, ones are yeah, like that is something I actually kind of knew about because I knew that like in the medieval <laughs> period, like there were a lot more exorcists. Yeah. Than what we have now, like there are very few exorcists still running around but don't you think it's kind of surprising that you didn't have to have full ordination to the priesthood to be an exorcist well i mean i'm i was raised pentecostal so that doesn't seem weird to me oh, at okay. all <laughs> what are you In talking about you've been given authority to cast surprising. out humans didn't you know it <laughs> all right so do you want to do uh walter's famous song now i yeah. could sing it if you want me to go for it all right i'll go for it Sorry about my really creaky chair, by the way. Are you hearing it? 
Nope, not at all. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Give me some kind of a signal if you want me to move my mic closer or farther away. I think, okay. okay. All right. <clears throat> Under the linden, under the head, under the tree, the was the moon to find the shone. The day he broke the bloom on the grass, for the morning, under the day. Schon in Sankt die Nacht die Gang. Ich kam gegangen zur der Aue, da was mein Friedel kommen eh, da ward ich empfangen, Herre Frau, dass ich bin selig jemer mehr. mich, wohl tu So what is that? Tell us, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about what you just sang. Yeah, so I looked up an existing English translation that rhymes and is pretty good. So shall okay. I read that up? Uh, yeah, read it. And maybe you can analyze it. I will do. Okay. Or I'll try. <laughs> Under the lime tree on the heather, where we had shared a place of rest, Still you may find there, lovely together, flowers crushed and grass downpressed. Beside the forest in the vale, Tandarade sweetly sang the nightingale. I came to meet him at the green, there was my true love come before. Such was I greeted, heaven's queen, that I am glad forevermore. Had he kisses a thousand some, Tandarade, see how red my mouth's become. There he had fashioned for luxury a bed from every kind of flower. It sets to laughing delightedly whoever comes upon that bower. By the roses, well one may, Tandarade, mark the spot my head once lay. If any knew he lay with me, may God forbid, for shame I'd die. What did he do? May none but he ever be sure of that, and I, and one little tiny bird, Tandarade. Who will, I think, not say a word? So the is like the is the the bird the 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 bird's refrain is that supposed to be just like uh, like an onomatopoeia of like what the bird song sounds like, or is that does that the time that, that I day? Yeah, maybe. Well, it's not translated, so I'm I'm thinking <laughs> that it must be just oh like, yeah yeah like that yeah, must be, be like is that is is that generally how. That, that's possible it you know i may have known that for sure at one point but uh i studied all this stuff 20 years ago so sometimes it's I fine get details but it's entirely possible that was yeah. my assumption it sounded yeah. like that because yeah, it sounds i mean it has that it seems like it's a representation of, mm -hmm. of the bird song yeah which would explain the choice to not translate it yeah because it's just like this is what people who spoke german in that time period thought that that's that's what that's how they heard that song 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of um, songs have a kind of tra la la little thing that yeah. you put in there, yeah, even it, if there isn't a bird could be in nonsense. it. So, right. The other thing is, it's yeah. just a nonsense word. Is the other possible? Yeah, yeah. Word. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um. So. Um. Yeah. So the interesting bit, the interesting, the most, the line that I want to call attention to uh -huh. is like because of the the uh, the innuendo going on in the poem. Uh huh. The line that uh, um, he held me as the queen of heaven mm. coming from a medieval German is very interesting. So, so it's like, go ahead. That's a little bit difficult because that line is Herre Frau, which just means noble lady. Mm. And so she says he, he greeted me or he received me. Noble lady that I'm glad forevermore. Um, some people translate that as Holy Mary, <laughs> Heaven's Queen. Right. It's it's her exclamation of right. wow, basically, right? But when I used to read it on my own, I always just thought it was, that she was remembering what he said to her. Well, but when still... he received her, he said, noble lady. So it, it's, we... it's actually hard to know. Well, if we go back to if we go back to if we go back to what I read at the very beginning from the Pendragon book, uh -huh. and if we look if we look at what I was what what Richard Roland and I were talking about in the conversation we had about the Grail recently, there's a way in which going what's going on what's going on here in the entire cycle of of courtly love is this like poetic awakening to the divine feminine. So yes. It is entirely so. So rather than ra rather than as a as as a as as a sacrilege, it can be seen as a direction toward like, wait a minute, that which is feminine also bears the image of God. Yes, and you know a few people in TLC have been expressing distress at the term divine feminine. Mm -hmm. Are forgetting that. The feminine also bears it? the image of God. Like well, you, that's the only way me, you can deny that there's such a thing as divine feminine is to say that that people who are feminine do not image God. Like you have so, to say that, right? So, <laughs> if asked to define it, I would assume the definition was something like the divine feminine means what the feminine is in the mind of God. Well, no. Well, I don't or is know, it? Like, but how the, the idea it? of defining it is inherently problematic because that's oh, okay. like that's like one of the that's like one of the features of the divine feminine is that it is like this is something that Richard and I talked about in the context of the Grail too, and this is like why Bulgakov like points at the Grail. Although I mean, Bulgakov actually does try to develop a kind of like systematic theology where, for Bulgakov, like the um. The divine feminine is is actually associated with the with the with the Uzia. Mm -hmm. So so it is so it's not actually it's not a hypostasis. Mm -hmm. But he says it is hypostasability. So it's like the ground of the, the ground of the possibility of there being hypostasis within divinity at all is is Sophia. And he defines it as wisdom, love, glory. Um but I think I think Mike, Michael Martin and I both like, and I like Bulgakov, but both of us kind of have this inclination toward thinking about that the divine feminine is best like the d divine feminine is best best approached, not through discursive reasoning, like mm -hmm. it's like there that, that that although that doesn't mean that like it doesn't mean that 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 doesn't mean that it's supposed to stay that way forever though because like mm -hmm. there's a, there's a point at which like. I think that also will have an apocalypse, but mm -hmm. it is, um, but generally in Christian tradition, it is, it is, it, it, it's at the layer of mystery where it's usually not something that is made explicit. It's something that just it just remains it just remains as a little subtle thing a little subtle thing in the background mm -hmm. and well and also it's not like this 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 okay 
what as long as we've opened this can of worms okay this is also the time like this same period that we're talking about is also the time of the explosion of of marian devotion yes in the catholic church mm -hmm. and i don't sure, think yeah. i don't think those things are incidental and the rosary came about at this time right bingo yeah yeah so which i'm sure is going to freak all the protestants out and, and <laughs> i already think we're all like we're idolaters but oh well but you know um i i ultimately like even if you're a protestant and you um and or an irrationalist i think that you have to you just you can't deny that there there is such a thing as the divine feminine otherwise you end up having to say that only men are properly image bearers of god so is the divine feminine the same thing as goethe's ewig weibliche uh explain that to me um I was hoping you would explain it to me. No, I, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily all remember. I don't necessarily remember all the German terms, honestly. It's one so. of the things that Faust wants to okay. understand. He wants to know the eternal feminine. Yes, I think, yes, I think he that conjures is. conjures Helen of Troy. Right, right, yeah. right, the, right. Um, and yes, I think there is a connection and um there's i don't know if i want to articulate it or if i could articulate yeah, that's it fine because i've been going against my own advice ah uh, yeah <laughs> that's fine <laughs> okay yeah. so anything else we want to say about this particular poem i mean i should i should just point out that there's definitely a real sexual relationship here right it's not one of these poems about yearning for an it's unattainable not about chase the more heart. no it is not no it is not no yes for sure what would you say like in your like let's say let's just say not generally but just like say in the german material like what per, like what what percentage of them you would you say actually fits that that idea of chase the more like how much how much oh. the material actually does feel, fit in that Kind of so the first mind. person who usually springs to mind in German poetry for that thread is uh, Reinmar von Hagenau, Reinmar der Alte, he's also called. Mm -hmm. But the problem with him is he has like a, um, he's got a poetic self, like he's he's playing a role that is the guy who never gets the girl. Mm. And that's kind of his thing. And so he's kind of amusing like uh he has a poem that literally starts out with him saying okay nobody ask me how i'm doing today i am not happy <laughs> because because his lady will never notice him um and he's always serving her and talking about how wonderful she is but uh you know she just won't pay attention to him there's one poem where he's speaking to the lady and he's like can you please just like pretend it's real pretend that you love me <laughs> but you know this is like a whole like it's like he thought up a whole scenario there's something we really like about that kind of though person. right there's something we're like like so and I, I think like i'm wondering if it's like later sensibilities that made us like decide that that was the soul of the courtly material even if it wasn't properly because there's certainly if you look at like later like 19th century stuff that definitely becomes a thing like oh so, it's the time to rip on wagner Maybe I was actually going to bring up Rostand first, though, because I Who? really Eben Rostand. Oh, who's that? He wrote, he wrote Cyrano de Bergerac. Oh, OK. So because that's actually I love that. I, I love Cyrano. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I love Cyrano. Um, and, and Cyrano is like it's like all of the romantic things in Cyrano, because not only is it unrequited love, but it's also like Cyrano celebrates the lost, you know, the lost cause uh -huh. And you know the you know the, the 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 fight that is in vain because it's just the you know it's the right thing to fight for and like all yeah, of uh -huh. that stuff and and, uh, and in fact my 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 favorite movie other than Conan the Barbarian is the 1992 or no 91 actually no it's 90 but the Cyrano de Bergerac uh, the the 
that was uh that had Gerard Depardieu as the lead that was produced mm-hmm. in the early 90s I've seen the old movie I with love Jose that Ferrer. I love that version so much uh-huh. yeah I don't like that one so much there's something about that well first of all like you lose the poet you lose a lot of the poetry when it's in English mm-hmm. so I just prefer to watch it in French with sure. subtitles Mm-hmm. um my french isn't good enough anymore to not have the subtitles but i can at still at least hear you know how it sounds matters right yeah. <laughs> so part of it is how it sounds of course um and the, yeah in, in fact particularly like my favorite like like my favorite moment is like the the way the way uh the way gerard depardieu plays the the no mercy speech is just like perfect like chef's oh, i haven't seen that one but I should okay watch it okay now, yeah. Yeah. I, I highly if you can find it if you can find it i highly recommend it it's actually not that easy to find anymore oh i used to have a copy of it on dvd i've got it somewhere on one of my hard drives but i have much like courtly love itself it is not so easy to find anymore not so easy to find anymore wow. yeah so yeah well what do you think why do you think we lost courtly love like we had some. Good I think because I, I think because Chris, I, I think it's because we're losing we're losing our Christian sensibilities and like yeah. ultimately at the end of the day, despite of the you know despite all of these things that about courtly love that you know make it seem maybe not so Christian on the surface, there's still mm. something profoundly Christian about it. And as yes. we and actually romantic love, I think is. The idea of romantic love, which ultimately I think has its origins in this courtly love tradition, and then gets developed mm-hmm. later, I think it's like it's like ultimately it's a love that is about being in love with love, and which is why which is why this which is why this unrequited kind of love gets placed so high mm-hmm. is because it 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 points. It, it's the clearest indication that well this isn't really pointing toward what it seems to be pointing toward hmm. i mean i would just say the unrequited love shows that you're a good servant right if you're serving a lady with no hope of reward right you're an exemplary kind of servant it also points that like somehow like what you're what you're aiming at is actually like not fully contained within the object of your love mm-hmm. like it's like you're you're seeing like it something about that is drawing you towards something and i think that's part like to me that's like why it's unrequited because if it were not unrequited then it would have to it would have to be something else now this is actually novak gives us a very negative turn well yeah and novak in his piece novak's emphasis on on the superiority of unrequited love for this kind of love story and the fact that it's better for the lovers to die without getting a chance to come together because that makes like the love more like pure and piercing and it never gets ruined by like everyday life right Right. that's that's very true of the romantic era but that's not true of the middle ages at all because medieval the medieval romances are full of people who get married and live happily ever after (laughs) You know? Right, and the, the Eric and Anita example that Eric and Anita, really, but part you know, parts of all gets married. He marries Conduera yeah. Morris. Yeah, they yeah. have children. Yeah, um, yeah, and there are many others. Yeah, many. So, um, but I think ultimately, like, it's because we're we're, I think we're reverting back to. I mean, it seems to me that we're reverting back to ideas about love that are not as informed by Christian sensibilities. Yeah, that's all I would be able to say, too. I thought you might come up with something fancier. I mean, yeah, like, it's just we're not Christian enough anymore. Right. And I don't really know if there's much. I don't know if I have anything like more insightful to say about it than that. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't either. But but other, I well, I do. Really I mean, I, I mean, it's kind of like some of the stuff that we see that's ugly. It's like we shouldn't be surprised by, right? <laughs> if people yeah. say that, like, you know, if people complain about like normalization of pedophilia. Well, look at classical. Look at mm-hmm. look at look at the classical age. Like, yeah. pederasty was totally socially acceptable and normal. In fact, mm-hmm. um. Plato is stands out in questioning the morality of it. Mm. Um, 
he actually tried there's there's a there's a part of the gorgias where he actually sh tries to shame gorgias for being a pederast yeah, if we have a couple minutes, do you want to say anything about relationships between men and women in classical literature and how they compare to medieval literature? Or do you have a hard stop at 1:30? Uh no, I don't have a hard stop yet. Um let's yeah, what would you like to what would you like to say about it? Like do you have anything you want to say? Well, I'm just trying to think who are the famous couples in classical literature whose love we could compare to lovers in medieval literature. I mean, like Helen and Paris like that's not an inspiring love story. Not at, at all. all. Right. <laughs> that whole story is just about mimetic writing well, more the, than the, it is the, about like people loving each other. The essay, I essay I shared with you earlier from uh, uh, that Harvard scholar tried to argue that that it has its roots in Ovid, but I just oh well, Ovid was very popular in the Middle Ages, yeah. and many of these poets had read Ovid. Right, but is, it, but, is it, is it, but is it Ovid or Ovid being read through the sensibilities of another era? Well, there's the there's that I too. Have. Just right. as Wagner was reading medieval literature through the sensibilities of his era, and so he yeah. recast it as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like Andreas Capellanus wrote a book called what was it called? Um, do you know this book? Yeah, uh, I I just read about it this morning. It's like it's okay. it's uh it's like a manual of courtly love. Exactly, basically. but I yeah. think he's leaning on Ovid a bit. In, you think so? In the style of that book, yeah. I mean, I think that's an established right fact. So people might want to look him up if they're interested in that connection. Yeah, actually, the the, the Harvard scholar that the article I shared with you, he was arguing that he was that he wasn't being serious. Yeah. Oh but yeah, a lot of people be, think that. Like, yeah, that he's attempting to be funny. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of the problem. And failing, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so part of the problem with medieval literature is because those people are so far from us, it can be hard for us to know how seriously to take them and uh and what exactly they meant. I think but here's yeah. the thing though. I would say I would say the grail literature is pretty much a rock solid case that you're that if you think they weren't taking it seriously you're you're off your rocker because oh, why i'm not saying it... they weren't taking well, i'm not no. saying that they weren't taking anything seriously but i'm saying if you if you're trying to prove a point by saying okay such and such a writer said this sentence and then i'm going to build a whole theory of courtly love on this sentence you might not know enough about that person's context and how he was relating to other people's works and how sarcastic he was being and stuff like that. So, right, so you need right, to and if you're talking about a medieval no, person, right. this is almost certainly the case because we have like basically we have so little biographic detail yeah. from the medieval period. No, but it's certainly true that people were taking it seriously. Like if you read Chrétien de Troyes or any of these these romances. Mm -hmm. They were taking the ideals seriously and they were really inspired by them for sure. Yeah, I think it's pretty yeah. evident. I I just think I'm wondering what you're doing as a reader to come away with that conclusion that they're. I don't know. Oh, that I mean, I I think it's reasonable to suppose that Andreas Capellanus was being kind oh, of sarcastic. Okay. Gotcha, 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 yeah. gotcha. Him specifically. Him specifically. There are specific reasons why people think that about his one text. About his Not that like the whole courtly love thing was a right. sham. Or <laughs> well, then there's a right. Do you think? Do you think? Here's the well, that leads to the question is like, do you think it was actually practice or do you think it just stayed at the level that it? You know, well, if people are interested in that question, they should read Courtly Culture by Joachim Bumke. Okay. Um, and can you give book. us a. Well, his thesis is that people did take these ideas deals seriously in a way but that real life is always far removed from ideals and you can find plenty of examples of uh, people in the middle ages behaving very badly etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but you know he talks about what life was really like at court and he talks about the place of the literature in the life of the court and uh yeah were then the, he does talk were, about ways were there ever actually courts of love huh were there ever actually courts of love courts of love what do you mean by that you haven't heard of okay <laughs> That must be an established phrase that has, has yeah not courts of love like there, there was this there's this idea that like that at least in some of the early scholarship purport, purported to be historical reality that uh, that in in the courts where this you know fine and more courtly love was being practiced that there would be like courts of women that would set up and judge lovers as to whether they were appropriately behaving within the rules of love. So it would be, would like, it be like an event that would happen. Yeah, like an event day. where it's like oh, yeah. where the women are placed in as the adjudicators. 
I would suppose that things like that could have happened sometimes, sure. They had some very interesting entertainments at court. There was one where the women would build a castle and go inside it. I mean, you know, like a like a castle out of like fabric or something, right? Gotcha, gotcha. And they'd all go in there. Like inside the built inside the court. And uh and men would like throw things into it <laughs> and like try to storm it, you know, and they'd like oh, they'd like throw like apples and and uh things and try to like get in the whatever was the door or whatever and the women would so try to we, like defend themselves inside we were all chosen or... apart even in the medieval period <laughs> but this yeah, is like not a had... bad thing because we because 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 we know that's a prerequisite for uh being able to see the kingdom of god oh there you go <laughs> okay so um oh okay i have a question for you you got it go so you it. said when you were talking to paul and richard Rowland, you mm. said Parsifal in Wolfram never achieves the Grail. Can you explain that? He becomes the he become he 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 becomes the Lord of the Grail Castle. Yeah, I mean, as far as I knew, that's achieving the Grail. So maybe achieving the Grail means something that I don't know about. Well, I was go like I was just like that was Richard's interpretation is that no one like that 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 essentially like no one except for Galahad achieves the Grail. I didn't read it that way. But I didn't feel like being contentious. So oh, I just okay. pointed out, I just, rather than get in an argument about whether he achieves the Grail or not in, in Wolfram's story, it is clear that he becomes Lord of the Grail Castle. Mm. Okay, yeah. Which is oh, like, yeah. he's no, the I custodian think you... of the Grail, so it's kind of weird to say he didn't achieve the Grail, mm. if he was the custodian of the Grail. And I actually, the other thing is, is like, I the other thing is, is I thought it was more important to make the point that I did about the meaning of being the custodian of the Grail. Mm-hmm. Because I thought that that was actually like a deeper and more important point about whether or not technically he achieves the grail. This mm -hmm. idea of the right orientation is to be a servant of the grail mm -hmm. rather than to be served by it was 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 what I what what I intuited to be the more important point to make in the moment. OK, yeah, well, that so. makes sense. Yeah, but I think as I don't see any indication in Wolfram that there's anything lacking in parts of Falls. Not at all. Of status with regard to the Grail, yeah. Like I think he he does what he was supposed and to, he's and a, he gets the right. position and that was ordained and, for him. And, and, and Wolfram Parsifal is just like a normal dude. He's not like that's why I like him better than like Galahad is just like I said. Like I said in that conversation, it was like Galahad. It's like hard for me to relate to Galahad. It really is. Yeah, it, I'm not sure. It's Wolfram funny because Malcolm Galahad. Malcolm Guy actually. He says he has a hard time relating to Lancelot because Lancelot has this sort of jock kind of demeanor. Oh, yeah. And so he always related to Galahad somehow because Galahad just seemed more bookish to him. But to me, it's like <laughs> Galahad just seems so like perfectly holy that I just like I never really Lancelot is like at least more human. Also, I played sports growing up. So, oh, that's interesting. Well, well you know, Wolfram is the least bookish German yeah, medieval right. romance author. Right. Yeah, he's he's a knight. He says, "Hey, I can't read a single letter, and this story is not a book. And if anybody calls it a book, I am going to be so mad." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's great. It's great, and it has like so many like cool features that are just like, I love the fact that the Grail is a stone. Mm hmm. In, in in Wolfram, I really, really that that I especially like the fact that the Grail is a stone, in light of the the Bulgakov meditation on the Grail that I shared at the beginning of that conversation, mm -hmm. because yeah. it's like here it is the Grail is like it's a piece of the earth that mm. has been transfigured through the blood and water that flowed from the side from from the side of Christ and. It was brought to earth by the neutral angels, which is also Yeah, just... that's crazy. But you know, <laughs> Trevor Sun has to retract that at the end of the story. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the funniest things about Wolfram's parts of all, is that just when he's wrapping everything up, like Trevor Sun runs on and he's like, Hey, um, do you remember that thing I told you about the neutral angels before? It was, wasn't really like that. Actually, you can only be for God or against him and there are no neutral angels. Don't don't be neutral. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Right. <laughs> It's like it's like some Dominican sidled up to Wolfram and was like, um, you know this thing you have about the neutral angels? I'm almost certain. <laughs> don't you think that was probably inserted by some later editor? Well, either I, I assume either it's, it's a weird thing for told Wolfram to do that or some. Later yeah, exactly. Editor. I yeah. think Wolfram meant what he said in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. All right, well, so maybe we've said everything we needed to say. I think, think yeah, I think this was uh, we stayed on, we stayed the course, and I think mm. uh, um, I still, I think, but my, my bottom line for me is like I think that like it's important for us in our age to pay attention to this because there's something this speaks to something that we're losing. Mm. And I don't know if we lose it. I don't know. Like, what is the, what, I mean, if we're going to have, if we're going to have a political mantra of love is love, what is the value of it? If we don't understand what love is. Mm. And, and you know, I think these guys that this, wrote a lot this, of poems asking and, what is love. Exactly. And, and I think this tradition again. of courtly love is like the beginning of the Christian imagination in that direction it's like okay what is like god okay god is love but but what does that mean is that is, and when we say god is god is love is it is it only agape or caritas or is it oh. or is god all all of is god the fullness of love in all of its guises mm. Yeah. And Michael Martin quotes somebody saying that the nice thing about courtly love is that it's a fusion of Eros and Caritas, right? Yeah. I think I read that. And that is a good point. Like, it's not a perfect fusion of them, but it's getting there and you can carry it forward and well, that's the big, to that's the big, the new, yeah. th the new theme we're going to be chasing in our next, the next big series we're going to start is actually, I've decided is going to be on this idea of the transformation of eros like that mm -hmm. yeah that's a good idea yeah and i think we're going to start with the divine comedy and and obviously i'm going to include solovyev's transformation of eros will be one of the things that we'll cover but if you mm -hmm. want to get in on some of those discussions i think yeah i would probably like you, that i kind of by the way i want to give you credit like in some ways like you you and sam like drawing the collective attention of tlc to these kinds of issues about like love and sex and like highlighting their importance by having that conversation that you had i think that inspired me to go that direction oh it's, nice so i think like that i don't think i would have arrived at that was being the next thing i think i probably would have ended up probably doing the zohar or something instead no i don't know anything about that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah Anyway, thank you for joining me, Laura. It's great yeah, as always. Thank you. thank you for 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 sharing your knowledge with us. Um, uh, I feel like I learned something, um, and I feel like this is probably just the beginning of a of a long conversation that will yeah. continue. Yeah, because you, you can never say all there is to say about it in an hour and a half. Well, how could you start. say all there is to say about love? No. <laughs> or to even think that you can articulate the fullness of love. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.